The one we just did here comes up in an application that I'm about to start talking about now related to motion, our main application so far, along parametric curves. Let's talk about that right now. This is our last thing to do today. We want to apply now this integral to a situation, a fairly simple situation involving motion along a parametric curve. Or probably better to say motion modeled with a parametric curve. A parametric curve is more than just a curve. It also involves the curve being traced out in a certain way with a certain speed that's not necessarily even constant, but can vary. Just like a bug walking across the paper might speed up or slow down or turn around, or a bug flying through the air might speed up or slow down or turn around or even try to hover, though they, the bug would fall down if it was not a hummingbird. Well, it's a hummingbird, uh, not a dragonfly. Okay. Parametric curves come from parametric equations. This is why I suggested that you read section 4.8 in chapter four before class today. Parametric equations give you X and Y coordinates as functions of time. X equals F of T, Y equals G of T. Now let's take a pretty simple example. Let's say F of T is just T and G of T is T squared. And let's say our goal is to find the distance traveled along this parametric curve, say from time zero to time two. Find the distance traveled, also called the arc length, from t equals zero to t equals two. And let's say position is measured in, I'm gonna imagine a bug, so let's not imagine meters, let's imagine centimeters. And time is measured in seconds. How do you find the distance traveled? It's not so easy because the motion is not along a straight line. It's a curve. In fact, we can even plot the curve by plotting points. Make a table of values for three variables, t, x, and y. Let's let t go up by half a unit each time, say. And then use these parametric equations to figure out x and y. X equals T, so the value of X is the same as T in each case. Y equals T squared. Zero squared is zero, 0.5 squared is 0.25, one squared is one, 1.5 squared is 2.25, and two squared is four. So if we graph this now in an XY plane, trying to make the scales of the axes approximately the same so that it's an accurate representation of the motion. Plot these points. Your picture is going to look about like this. Then connect the dots with a smooth curve. And also draw arrows on the curve indicating the direction of motion as time increases. In this case, the motion is from lower left to upper right, but it could have been the opposite way. It could be leftward or downward motion. That's possible. Now you can eyeball the answer to the, to the question, right? To find the distance traveled. This is approximately a little longer than the straight line between these two points. 
the length of that line can be found with the Pythagorean theorem to be square root of 20, which is between four and five. The answer has got to be between four and five, most likely, because this is a little bit longer than that, not much longer. Could be closer to five than to four. But can we find it exactly? Yes, you can. How? By doing an integral. But wait a minute. Don't integrals give you areas? How could we find a length by doing an integral? Well, we've really done it before. When we integrated the speed, we got the distance traveled. Same principle holds here, except it's two-dimensional motion in a plane. It's the same principle, though. But that means we need to figure out what the speed is. Speed is the derivative of the distance traveled. It's not so easy because that's a curve. It is speeding up, by the way. For each half second of time, you travel further and further. So the bug is walking faster and faster. There's a speed function of t. And here's its formula. It's the square root of f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared. <clears throat> to derive this formula is pretty difficult to do rigorously because it's curve instead of a straight line. In physics classes, you might derive it with hand wavy arguments involving infinitesimally small time intervals. And in fact, I do want to talk about that in here, just not today. However, what I do want to introduce you to today is a little more physics that is a little bit more rigorous, though still not a full explanation. I want to talk a little bit about vectors. Vectors are not explicitly in chapter seven, for example. You'll find them a little bit in section 4.8. So I want to talk about the little bit you find in section 4.8. What are vectors? People who've had physics think vectors are easy. People who have not had physics think vectors are hard. Well, even if you're in physics or have had physics, you might still think it's hard. <clears throat> At the most basic level, vectors are typically thought of as being arrows. What, like those arrows? No, straight arrows. These are, these are curved, quote unquote arrows. Straight arrow, like uh, an arrow starting at the origin and maybe going to this point here. A full straight arrow. That's an example of a vector. And in fact, since I'm starting at the origin and I'm ending it along a curve at a certain moment in time, we call it a position vector. Position vector. For the motion at a certain moment in time. And the standard kind of notation for it is a little strange. It's an R with a little half arrow above it is what people typically draw of T. It does depend on what T is. It changes over time. If time is a half, it's a small vector like this. If time is one, it's a, a little bit bigger vector about like that. It gets longer as time goes by. And in fact, it's rotating somewhat too. It's the arrow, the angle it's making with the positive x-axis keeps getting bigger. It's a variable vector, you might say. A function, depends on time. How do you describe it algebraically? You need these functions, f of t and g of t. They, it should make sense that they describe the vector. You also need to think in terms of what are called, well, 
three different ways people describe it. Some people use the word coordinates, just like points have coordinates, x comma y. Some people uh, say component. Other people, like me, say component. I could say component, but I don't know. I just find it easier to say component. These functions are called the, the components of the vector. Essentially, the x displacement in the horizontal direction and the y displacement in the vertical direction. And the way we write the vector in the abstract with those components is we put the first component in front of a symbol called i hat and written like this, and the second component, g of t, in front of another symbol called j hat and written like this. And you don't typically bother with the dots above the i and the j. i hat and j hat. What in the world are those? And why are we adding them? I hat and J hat are called the standard unit vectors. I hat points directly to the right and has length one. J hat points directly upward at a 45 degree angle from I hat and also ha has length one. That's supposed to be a J here. J, J hat. <clears throat> to understand what's going on here, you have to talk about the meaning, the geometric meaning of vector addition. In other words, what does it mean to add two arrows? And you can certainly give it a meaning. And this is where if you've had physics, it's definitely helpful. I want to get into that today. What I want to mention today is that once you've got a position vector, you can use it to create something called a velocity vector. Velocity vector, v of t with, say, a little half arrow above the v. By the way, vector notation is very inconsistent. I make my little half arrows like that. Some people make them the other, other direction, like that. Some people make full arrows one way or the other. Some people don't make arrows at all. Some people put lines under the vectors. Some people try to make them bold faced like in books. There's lots of different, very inconsistent notations for vectors. It's probably what makes them confusing. But what is this velocity vector? It's, well, if that's a position, maybe it should be its derivative. Yeah, that's what it is. It's r prime of t, or if you prefer in Leibniz notation, dr dt. And how do you find it? Do I need to differentiate this? And if I do, what do I do about the i hat and the j hat? Well, the i hat and the j hat <clears throat> are constant vectors. They just get carried along for the ride. And the plus sign, well, differentiation is still linear. It gets carried along the right, for the right. The answer for the velocity vector is its first component is f prime of t, and that goes next to the i hat. And its second component is g prime of t, and that goes next to the j hat. So for our problem, what are these things for our problem? For our problem, f of t is t, g of t is t squared. The position vector is t i hat the plus t squared j hat. And the velocity vector is 1 times i hat, the derivative of t is 1, plus 2t j hat. In other words, it's i hat plus 2t j hat. <clears throat> is, that an error? is that an arrow? I've said vectors are arrows. Yes, it can be interpreted as an arrow. And this gets more confusing. While the position vector is good to draw with the starting point at the origin, with the velocity vector, it's a good idea to draw it so that the 
starting point of the arrow is at the location of the bug as it's moving. Because if you do so, the arrow will be tangent to the curve, that's why. It'll be pointing in the direction of motion. I'm not gonna draw it, but that's what would happen. I am going to, after class, make a Mathematica, I'll still show you the start of it here, that will animate the motion involved here and that you should download and, and play with, run, make sure you see it. We'll talk about it more on Wednesday. For the moment though, what's the point? The point is essentially by the Pythagorean theorem, the speed is the length of this vector. Speed is the length or magnitude, it's sometimes called, of the velocity vector v of t. This is not a proof that this is a good thing to do, okay? By any means, this is not a proof. You're just kind of trusting me here that the speed should be the length of the velocity vector. The velocity vector is a vector, it's an arrow. The speed is just an, a number for any fixed t. It's an ordinary function of time that we can graph and find the area under to get the integral and therefore to get the distance traveled. The distance traveled is going to be the integral of the speed and that would be the area under its graph, but it's not the same as the area under this graph. These are different functions. That's a parametric curve. That's an ordinary function. What is it equal in this case, for our example? For our example, this becomes square root of one squared plus two t squared, which becomes square root of one plus four t squared. And that's why I did this integral. It's a very similar integral to this. Or if I integrate that, it's a very similar integral. What is the distance traveled as a function of time? <clears throat> I could write it as an improper integral, but I want to be consistent now with what we did the first week of class, first week and a half. I'd like to write this as a definite integral with a variable upper limit of integration. T up on the top to match the T there. But if I do that, I better use some other dummy variable, oh, like tau again, here. So the distance traveled is the integral from zero to T of square root of one plus four tau squared d tau. And if I had to do that integral by hand, I'd want to use a trig substitution. Back on this problem, I let x equal tan theta. The one here is a little trickier because of the four. The four is two squared. Maybe I should let two tau equal tan theta. Maybe that's what I should do. And that is the best thing to do. Because then four tau squared is two tau quantity squared is tan squared theta. And you'll have a one plus tan squared theta there and you'll, that'll be secant squared theta and you'll take its square root and that kind of thing. As far as d tau, you're going to have two d tau equals secant squared theta d theta. So that means d tau is one half secant squared theta d theta. I won't finish it, but you go from there. Let's finish class by seeing what Mathematica produces here. This is going to be the Mathematica notebook that I I'm going to share with you. And this stuff here, it does represent the setup. F of T is T, 
That's the x coordinate of the point of the bug as it moves. G of t is t squared. There is my r of t. I'm using curly braces and a comma to represent it as a vector in Mathematica, no i hat or j hat. V of t is the velocity, it's the derivative of the position. And here's the speed is the square root of f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared. Enter all this. Here's a formula for the speed, square root of one plus four t squared. If I do as, a, as an indefinite integral in Mathematica, that's okay. And you, by hand, you'd put a plus C, though the C would end up being zero here. However, something a little strange seems to have happened. What's that? Ar is that arc sine? No, there's this extra H at the end. Is that a typo? No, it's not. That's arc cinch. The inverse function of the cinch function. What is the cinch function? Some people have learned about cinch before and some people haven't. The cinch function, S-I-N-H of X is actually an exponential function. It's this. Weird, what, what? If you've never heard of cinch, you're completely confused. Like what in the world is that, right? Cinch, huh? Don't worry about it too much. Let me just say that its graph looks like this. It's one-to-one. -one. It's got an inverse function called the arc cinch function. And it shouldn't be too surprising that if the cinch function involves exponential, exponentials, probably the arc cinch involves logarithms. And that would be matching what we got there. So that arc cinch function is actually some sort of weird logarithm in disguise. But I can confirm what the final answer is here for the distance traveled in exact form is that involves the arc cinch. And if you approximate that, it's between four and five, about 4.65 for the distance traveled. Okay. So again, I'll make an animation before I put this on Moodle. We will get into more details with animations on Wednesday, and possibly even a Mathematica assignment or something to work on after Wednesday cl Wednesday's class. Have a good day.